Amen. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to be here today. You know, I, we've talked about, we're going to talk about this more as we move through the book of Mark, but I, I found this language uh, a few years ago, and, and it's meant a lot to me that as, as Christians, as folks who are seeking after God, as folks who some of you may not identify as Christian in this room, but you're here, you're seeking after something sacred. For those of us who are really f- trying to find God in the midst of this world, this language that we need to stay awake to both the hope and the horror has meant a lot to me. Stay awake to the hope and the horror. As Christians, sometimes we focus solely on the hope, um, and, and we kind of turn a blind eye to a lot of the suffering that is going on around us. But then also, we can also get consumed by the horror and the nightmares that we see all around us, and it's hard to have hope. And so as, as a church, as a community, I'm really trying myself as an individual and also encouraging you all to continue to try to stay awake, to stay awake to both the hope and the horror as we navigate just some really, really hard stuff right now in our world. You know, sometimes I feel like if, if we're truly paying attention, it's, it's hard to, to always be happy or to always have that sense. I, I think that, that we're going to experience a lot of bad emotions because there's so much bad stuff happening, and, and it ought to affect us. But at the same time, there's still beauty, and there's still goodness around us, and we've got to try to keep our eyes open to that as well. And I believe that Jesus offers us a model for that. And over the course of our series through Mark, we're going to really look to Jesus to help us figure out how we can really stay true uh, to what God has called us to in the midst of all all these challenges that we're facing around us. So as I mentioned last week, we're going to be uh, studying the gospel of Mark up until Easter. And I want you to remember that Mark is a book that is all about action. Um, You know, some of the other gospels, uh, Matthew and particularly Matthew and, and well, Luke and John, for that matter, there's a lot of teaching of Jesus in those Gospels, and, and I love Jesus' teachings. Mark has some teaching, but Mark has a lot of just describing what happens. And so we're going to be paying attention to what the action is in the story, what Jesus does, people's response to Jesus, and trying to find um, some truth in the midst of that. And, and the question for Mark ultimately is not do we have the right thoughts about Jesus, but are we actually living like Jesus? Do our lives look like the life of Christ? Because that's what it means to truly be his disciple, is to to model our lives after the one that we follow, which is Jesus Christ. And so last week I introduced you to three like subplots that are running throughout the book of Mark, and these will come up over and over and over again. So I want you to remember them. We talked about the first one, Jesus' community of disciples, how Jesus went out and formed community by calling disciples. Um, And and these are not just the 12 disciples. There were lots of other followers who were very close to Jesus and spent lots of time with him and really helped him in his work. We also see another subplot, the second one of Jesus' ministry and time among the crowds. So he had his, his people who followed him, but he also went out among the crowds, out into the community, out among the people over and over and over again. And he spent lots of time with the crowds. And then the third subplot is Jesus' conflict with the authorities. In Mark, there is lots of conflict. If you think following Jesus is just going to be easy and everybody's just going to get along, then uh, I would encourage you to pay attention to all the conflict that Jesus gets into uh, because I, and his disciples as well. Um, and so there's lots of conflict with the authorities. So just remember, disciples, crowds, authorities. Disciples, crowds, authorities are going to come up over and over and over again. So today, We're going to look at the first 14 verses in Mark, and there's so much we could talk about in these 14 verses, but I'm going to focus on three themes um, that are going to help inform the way we read the whole gospel. So we did the three subplots. I'm going to do three more things. That's what preachers do. We always have three. Some, you know, I guess, I don't know why. Three, maybe we can remember. Sometimes one is better than three, because three is hard to remember. But these three are very important, and I want to talk about these three themes that we find in these 13 verses. And so... Um, I said 14, but I have written 13, so we'll see. Uh, it's either 14 or 13. We'll see as I read it how many I actually read. Um, it, is, uh, it is 13. All right, good, good. All right, I'm going to start from the beginning, John, or Mark 1.1. 1, 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, 
as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one who is more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. So do you see what I mean when I talk about Mark wasting no time in his writing, about Mark being short and brief and also all about action? He starts out his gospel right off the bat talking about Jesus' ministry. There's no birth narrative in Mark. He doesn't talk about Jesus' birth. He doesn't talk about uh, any of Jesus' childhood or his adolescence. He doesn't talk about his parents, Mary and Joseph. None of that. He starts right off the bat with this prophecy and then John the Baptist, and then Jesus' baptism, then he's tempted in the wilderness, and then his ministry begins. We can't cover all of what happens in these 14 verses, or 13 verses actually, um, but I want to share with you the three themes that will help us understand the entire gospel. The first theme that I find in these verses is the theme of invasion. Now, this is a, a loaded term, right, invasion. But I really want you all to understand what the writer of Mark is doing here. Mark is depicting Jesus' mission as kind of like an invasion into territory held by an enemy. That this is not some lighthearted thing. This is intense. And Jesus is moving into a territory that does not want him there. The scholar Matt Skinner says that evil lurks in many corners of Mark's world. There are unclean spirits. There is division and rejection. There is political and religious violence culminating in an awful execution on the cross. Jesus is depicted in these first verses as a powerful, spirit-filled son of God engaged in kind of a cosmic battle with the evil powers and principalities. This is how Mark is portraying his story. God invading earth in Jesus Christ. Now, at Jesus' baptism, some dramatic things happen when he comes up out of the water. One thing that occurs is that it says the heavens were torn open. Now, in Matthew and Luke, we read the same story about Jesus' baptism, but they don't use the same language. They just say the heavens were opened. But Mark is much more intense and forceful. He says that the heavens are torn or ripped open. The Greek word here is the word schizo, and it's really a strong word. You know, when you just open up something, you can put it back together, right? But when you tear something, it's permanent, it's lasting, and, and what is described here is not just a peaceful parting of the heavens, but we're talking about a forceful invasion. It is being ripped open, and God is coming to earth. And so what is Marcus portraying is that in Jesus, God has torn open the heavens and come into earth to reclaim our existence and bring his rule and reign to places where other reigns seem to hold power. Mark wants us to know that in Jesus, God has invaded our world to establish his rule and reign. Now, various scholars and writers have spoken about God being on the loose in Mark. And I like this language, on the loose. I, I grew up in a small town called Paintlick, Kentucky. It's in Garrett County, not too far from here. 
And when I lived in Paint Lick, they referred to me as a city boy in Paint Lick because I didn't live on a farm. Uh, I didn't know anything about that stuff. My dad was a preacher, and so, you know, we, uh, we, didn't, we weren't from that area. We moved there when I was starting uh, first grade. And, and so as a city boy, I wasn't a city boy, really. I came from, like, you know, a small town in Tennessee, so I really wasn't a city boy. But I didn't live on a farm. But I, I remember one day I was at my friend's house, and he did live on a farm, and he had four-wheelers. And I loved riding on the four-wheelers. Now, I couldn't actually drive one. I tried. I was terrible at it. Uh, so I would ride with him around his farm. But one day, his cat, his, one day his dad came home, and he was out working on the farm, and he told us, he's like, I want you all to be careful out there because word is out that a raging bull is on the loose uh, in the area, knocking down fences and just causing uh, trouble all throughout the farm. And he told us to be careful. I don't know if he was telling us the truth, but that image has stuck with me of an idea of a bull just wreaking havoc all over Garrett County, and I knew that bull was going to find us. And I was like, I hope this four-wheeler is fast uh, to get away from this thing. And so it was a little terrifying to think that this bull was on the loose, knocking down fences all throughout the farm. And I think it's very fascinating to think of God in this way. Does that image of God as a bull on the loose, tearing down fences all throughout the farm, does that feel uh, maybe a little scary to you? We believe, and Mark is what is telling us, is that the heavens have been torn open, and now God is on the loose in the world. And for some of us, this might feel like good news that God is on the loose in the world. But for others of us, it might sound a little terrifying to think that God could be so close and so wild and so free. The Greek word schizo is used in one other place in Mark. Towards the end of the book of Mark, we find something else being torn open. Do y'all know what is torn open in the end of Mark? Does anybody know? Yes, the separation, the curtain that separated um, the temple, this part of the temple from this place called the Holy of Holies. And so in Mark 15, 37, Jesus breathes his last breath on the cross. And as he dies, in verse 38, we read that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It's the same exact word that we find at the beginning of Mark when the heavens are torn open. And this brings us to our second theme in these verses in Mark. It's the theme of boundary breaking. In chapter 1, at Jesus' baptism, the heavens were torn open. Schizo, the same word. The sky was viewed back then as kind of a firmament or a separation that kind of separated the heavens from the earth. And so it was a boundary in many ways that separated God from humanity. And in this moment of Jesus' baptism, it says that the heavens were actually torn open and this boundary that separated God from humanity was broken and that God was let loose in the world. Now, at the end of Mark, when the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, another significant boundary was broken. The temple curtain was there to separate this part of the temple from the rest of the temple. And it was called the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a sacred place, but also a dangerous place. The Israelite faith taught that to be near God was actually it was a very sacred thing, but, but it was actually a bit of a dangerous thing to be very close to God. And no one was allowed in the Holy of Holies except one person, the high priest. And it was only on one moment in the year, the Day of Atonement. Now, in a sense, the Holy of Holies, you could think of it in some ways as a spiritual cage to keep the dangerous God at bay. But when Jesus died, the curtain of separation was torn and God was let loose out into the world. Some people might be encouraged and think, okay, good. Now God will set some things right that need to be set right. But those who are in comfortable positions of power were probably terrified at the idea of God being let loose into the world. One rhetorical device, this kind of strategy that Mark uses in his gospel, is something called an inclusio. And for those who, who like to nerd out on these things, it's, it's a very cool way, rhetorical kind of device and strategy he uses all throughout his gospel. And what it is basically is that the, he'll use the same word or phrase or theme at the beginning and at the end of a section of kind of scripture. And then if you see that, then what you read at the beginning and end helps you make sense of what is in the middle of all of it. 
Now, it's pretty neat because the whole gospel of Mark is one big inclusio. At the beginning, you have this tearing of the temple. You have boundary breaking. At the end, you have tearing as well, boundary breaking. And so it helps us see that one way we need to read the entire gospel of Mark is through this theme of boundaries being broken and God being let loose in the world. And what we see in the ministry of Jesus all throughout the gospel is Jesus traveling all throughout the land, breaking boundaries and tearing down walls that separate humans from God and also separate humans from each other. So boundaries are broken at the beginning and at the end and all throughout the gospel of Mark. I wonder, I wonder, because we are called actually to be players in this boundary-breaking movement. Jesus has invited us to join him. So I wonder what boundaries need to be broken today. Now, there are healthy boundaries out there that we're learning increasingly over the last few years that we need to have healthy boundaries. But there's also boundaries that Jesus needs to break down in our world, things that keep us separate from one another and also keep us separate from God. So we have invasion, we have boundary breaking, and the final theme is what I call possessed and driven. Now, after the heavens were torn open, the Spirit of God, it says, came down like a dove and rested upon Jesus. Now, um, that's what most modern translations say, that the Spirit rested upon Jesus. Now, my image of this has always been like this sweet little bird descending down and just resting and perching on Jesus' shoulder. It's just a little cute image. Um, But we're not talking about cute birds resting on uh, on shoulders here. Mark is talking about an invasion here, so keep that in mind. This is an intense scene that's happening. The Greek word they've translated as a pond is a word ice, E-I-S, and it usually means actually into, not onto. I didn't do very well. I I didn't understand the Greek and all Hebrew and all that very well in seminary, but I can get into some of this stuff, and it, it really helps me because Ice usually means into, but we've translated it upon. Now, for various theological reasons, I can understand why translators are reluctant to talk about God's Spirit coming into Jesus at that point. Because wouldn't have the Spirit already been in Jesus, right? If Jesus truly is the Son of God. It makes sense why they would make that choice. However, what we see here in this narrative is not the image of a gentle dove perching upon Jesus. But we see Jesus being possessed by God's Spirit. We see the Spirit coming into Jesus and filling him up. And what we see after is the Spirit actually possesses Jesus and takes hold of him. And the next few verses talk about Jesus being then driven by the Spirit out into the wilderness. It's intense language. Once again, the translators, I think, get it wrong again. The NIV says that the Spirit just sent Jesus out into the wilderness. No, the Spirit impelled him, as the New American Standard says, or drove him or thrust him out into the wilderness. The Spirit of God possessed Jesus, took a hold of him, and was let loose inside of him. And the Spirit drove Jesus into this boundary-breaking mission of establishing God's rule and reign here on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus went out exposing these cultural myths of violence and control and greed and exclusion and power through the way he lived, the way he loved, and the way he healed. And as his followers, I believe we are invited to be players in this boundary-breaking movement of God's reign here on earth. I wonder what happens when we are possessed by God's Spirit. When God's Spirit truly takes a hold of us, what happens when the Spirit drives us? We see in Jesus what happens when a man is consumed and possessed by the Spirit of God. You know, we often pray for revival, and often revival can just be a lot of singing and a lot of prayer, which is wonderful. But if the Spirit is going to take hold of us, then we need to look what happened to Jesus when the Spirit truly entered Jesus and took hold of him. It drove him out into the world on this boundary-breaking mission to see this world redeemed and made whole. Jesus was driven by the Spirit, and he went through the world setting people free from these evil forces that ensnared them and entrapped them. And naturally, what happened is the evil forces responded with vengeance and with might. When progress is made towards beauty and peace and equity and belonging and togetherness, there's always backlash. It has been a 
true all throughout history. But Mark makes it clear in the first verse of the gospel that this is the beginning of good news about Jesus. This is good news. Even though it's an invasion, it's a good one because Jesus is coming to bring something beautiful and right and good in this world. He wants them to know that there will be struggle, but the gospel is good news. I read these words a few years ago, and I shared them a few years back with you all, but I want to share them again by this scholar named Brian Blunt. And he says that if you want to know what happens when God gets on the loose and gets into you, take a look at what happened to Jesus. When God gets into you, you get into trouble because God drives you until you're running wild in a world hell-bent on religiously remaining the same tame, shameful self. I think a question we can reflect on, has we let God, have we let God loose in our lives? Like if we allowed God to truly have his rule and reign within us and to drive us and to lead us in our lives, often I think we don't have much of the spirit working within us because we're too scared to really allow the spirit to lead us. Because it's scary to think about where God might lead us in this world. Do we have God locked up in some kind of comfortable spiritual cage? And are we willing to open that up and allow God to work in us and through us? What boundaries need to be broken in your life? What boundaries need to be broken in our community? How would your life look different if the Spirit of God possessed you and drove you? These are some questions to be thinking about. I want you all to remember that we can tap in to the boundary-breaking power of God to change the world in which we live. Jesus started this movement uh, many, many years ago, and many others have like, carried that torch. And now it's our time. It's our time to carry that torch. In these difficult times in our community and across our world, we can choose to like shrink And we can live in our small, kind of well-defined, comfortable box. And we can try to keep God in the box we've created for God. Or we can expand. And we can live big with enough room for new possibilities and relationships and dreams. We can be driven by that same spirit that drove Jesus. And we can participate in God's liberating work in this world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.